My name's Rosalind Cook. I'm the Managing Solicitor of the Homeless Persons Legal Service in Sydney, um, and I'm delighted to be your facilitator for this final plenary session of the day, Beyond the Criminalisation of Inner City Homelessness. Um, I'll start by acknowledging the two major sponsors of the conference, the Victorian Government and the Salvation Army. Um, it's been a really interesting day for me. This is my first time at the National Conference, um, and I've enjoyed meeting many of you. Um, some of the really interesting things that we've heard about so far today have been about the role of poverty in homelessness, some of the specific factors like inadequate income support, rising housing costs, the need for more public and social housing, and in particular the need for coherent policy and cooperation at all levels of government. I think we've also, um, and we're in a very friendly audience for this message, come to the conclusion that it's really important to recognise that decent housing is a human right. Um, this afternoon, I think the session is going to be really interesting because we turn to a corollary point, which is that just as decent housing is a human right, being able to be in and to use public spaces is also a right that we have. Um, it's a right that all humans have, including people who are homeless. Um, this idea has come under increasing pressure over the last 18 months, especially in the capital cities. We've seen it very strikingly in both Melbourne and in Sydney. Um, partly because we've seen an increase in homelessness in absolute terms, but also because the issue has become visible in a way that it hasn't been for some time. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing a panel with a depth of expertise in three jurisdictions, Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. Today we're going to begin with a keynote address by the new Lord Mayor of Melbourne, the Right Honourable Sally Capp. Following the Lord Mayor's address, she will join a panel discussion featuring Monique Wiseman, Aboriginal Program Manager at Wayside Chapel in Sydney and good friend. Um, <laughs> Lucy Adams, the Manager of Strategic Policy and Advocacy at Victorian Legal Aid um, and until recently Manager of Homeless Law at Justice Connect, my counterpart in Melbourne. And David Pearson, the Executive Director of the Don Dunstan Foundation in Adelaide, who I think will bring a really interesting comparative perspective. Um, so now could I please ask you to join me in welcoming to the stage the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, the Right Honourable Sally Capp. Thank you, Roz, and good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the City of Melbourne, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Boimurong, Woiwurrung, Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past and emerging. I uh, would also like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Beverly Pinder, who is the chair of our homelessness portfolio at the City of Melbourne and does a huge amount of work uh, in this area, to our City of Melbourne team, many of whom are here today and have helped me prepare as well, so thank you, uh, and to others who I will come to who uh, do such a lot of work with the City of Melbourne. I need to acknowledge Michael Fotheringham, who is the new Executive Director of Ahuri. Well done, and uh, really looking forward to working with you. Uh, to all of today's speakers and everybody that's contributed to what has been a fantastic uh, agenda and tomorrow and uh, to all of you for participating. This is awesome looking at this many people here at the MCG who are passionate about and dedicated to how we can do better around uh, helping people who are experiencing homelessness. So welcome to you all and thank you, thank you for all of your efforts and actions. Well. I would love to tell you that I have memorised my speech, but I haven't, because I am really on the run in so many ways. Uh, but I am here because whilst this speech might not be embedded in my mind, this topic is embedded in my heart. Uh, and together with the rest of the City of Melbourne team and our uh, collaborators and all of the agencies, I'm absolutely dedicated to helping in any way that I can. And that's why I brought my pen as well today because I'm not the expert speaking on this panel. I am somebody who is going to talk about uh, our interest, our passion, the things we are doing, the expertise in our team, but also the chance to listen to the experts on the panel and write down as many things as I possibly can to make sure that I'm contributing back. I'm looking at Leanne Mitchell who runs this uh, at the City of Melbourne. I can uh, contribute in as many positive ways uh, as possible uh, to this really important issue. Uh, so thank you uh, for listening uh, with uh, patience as well to me this afternoon. So 
Uh, with all of our ideas and goodwill, there are words uh, that we are using today uh, that are still not satisfactory. There are words when we're relating to homelessness where we call it an issue and we speak of protocols to manage it. And I know that's a big part of our focus this afternoon. Uh, and at conferences such as this, we are invited for considered responses to this issue. And of course, uh, you in the field know that what is really important is what's behind these words. It's the human experience behind these words and these protocols. It's about the people for whom disadvantage has become their daily lot. People who a caring city should recognise for their needs, their circumstances, the obstacles that they face in finding a secure housing and a safe future, and also recognises the value that they bring to our community as well. City of Melbourne staff, as I've said, and uh, other agencies put in an enormous amount of time to speaking and meeting uh, about these issues. But importantly now, and something I'm so excited about, it's about meeting the individuals that are experiencing homelessness and working with them towards solutions. It's how we hear about their distressing experiences and circumstances. It's how uh, we can work with them to consider the services and programs that may work for them uh, and where it works for them. Recently, a workshop was held to discuss storage options for people's possessions and participants really focused on the individuals. What does it mean for men, women and children? Uh, and in particular, we had a mother with two small children uh, and what those possessions meant to her and the way that she can safeguard uh, those possessions together with us. Uh, it's about people being worried about losing their stuff, uh, that they want to be able to stay close to their belongings. Uh, and it was a really important issue that came through for me during uh, the campaign for Lord Mayor and something that became a platform of uh, my campaign and some of the ideas flowing from that. Some people express stories about staying close to a bathroom so they could minimise movement away from their things. Life gets pretty limited when you're thinking about what does that mean in terms of your movements and what you can access from those sorts of places. Going to get a meal or attending a medical appointment could mean losing everything that's important to you. And that becomes quite a different decision framework than those that, that we are facing every day. And it's important for us to know that it isn't just stuff to them. It's about meaningful personal items and other essential elements such as bedding. Uh, following a lot of work uh, during the campaign, including being out at the night cafe and being out uh, with St Binnie's uh, and really uh, speaking to people about how important their possessions are, that's how we started talking about initiatives such as lockers in safe spaces for people on our streets, which is something we're working on at the moment. So when we do better understand the physical detail of their lives, and I believe that people who are experiencing homelessness are more likely to trust us and be open to our services and plans to get them safe, secure housing with support services when we build those relationships based on understanding and sharing and trust. So when you consider all of that, this conversation should be emotive. It isn't about an issue and protocols. It's so much more than that. Uh, and uh, it means that we can then be focused on delivering a caring and compassionate response to these issues rather than something that's about process, structure and regulation. And I can tell you that the number one issue that people write to me about as Lord Mayor is ideas and emotive responses to people experiencing homelessness on the streets of the city of Melbourne. And it certainly gets a very emotive response from me. So let's embrace words like compassion and respect. Let's own them as we launch National Homelessness Week today. And uh, they're those emotive words that I take into as many forums, including dinner parties in leafy suburbs in the uh, east of Melbourne, 
Uh, that's the sort of conversation we should be having and I'm pleased to say that it's mostly very welcome. So in my experience of the City of Melbourne, it is a caring city uh, and in local government we feel very supported to continue our services because the people of Melbourne are getting behind us. Homelessness doesn't need to be politicised and certainly it doesn't need to be criminalised. To remind us of this, let's look back to Melbourne's experience in the past few years. And it's been in lots of media, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but just to summarise. Uh, City of Melbourne people know their streets well uh, and say the public response to homelessness has changed over the last couple of years. It's such a pleasing outcome. Our community was and is concerned about rough sleepers, yet in 2016, that commitment was tested. Prior to then, the City of Melbourne already funded activities and programs that brought agencies together to protect people in public spaces. The City was already a signatory to the human rights-based protocol that had been developed for the Commonwealth Games in 2006. Public concerns over homelessness had been steadily increasing and the City of Melbourne continued to help people uh, connect uh, into services that could help. The City's compliance officers generally let rough sleepers be as long as they were in no danger to themselves or others. Yet in the summer of 2016, the issue was suddenly amplified uh, in the most negative of ways. Some press reports focused on homeless people. Some of those press reports, I'm sorry, really sparked a big public response to uh, the, the plight of homeless people. And a group of people who said that they felt they, that they were uh, unsafe set up a camp in our city at a time uh, of peak visitation uh, and over summer, as many of you know, when uh, the um, Australian Open was on. Unfortunately, from that point on, discussion took a turn and the City of Melbourne came under fire from many, many stakeholders at times for its response or lack of response, depending on what side of the debate they were on. Uh, but this wasn't the only experience requiring a response. The street count of that year revealed the number of rough sleepers in Melbourne had climbed. And so the situation was real and perceived. In many ways, the new figure shaped public and political will to change the way that we approach the issue of homelessness and what's occurred. While many people sat on public housing waiting lists and still do, on the front line, local government had to balance two needs and unfortunately often seen as conflicting needs. Responding to the most vulnerable and keeping the city safe and comfortable for everyone that uses the city. There was at one time, in response to uh, that summer in 2016, a proposal to amend local laws that defined how homelessness was managed in the city. A proposal, thankfully, that the community resoundingly and then the council rejected. They said no to criminalising homelessness here in the city of Melbourne. The message from Melbournians was that this is a caring city and its council should find better ways to support the most disadvantaged in what has become famously known as the most livable city in the world. So in my past few weeks as Lord Mayor, I have listened and learned a lot from all of the partners, agencies, frontline workers and our staff who since 2016 have gathered really valuable information about people they meet and support and want to support more. The result of their collaborations is an ongoing multi-million dollar range, I was going to say billion but not quite there yet, multi-million dollar range of programs to get to know and support people sleeping rough or at risk of homelessness, even better, let's catch them early. The programs I believe are well informed and well targeted, there's always more we can do but we're actually now starting to see some great results. I think one of the biggest differences is that we have teams of people across sectors uh, and across uh, services uh, that are working in teams together to know and understand the difficulties experienced 
by the people, uh, men, women and children, uh, living on our streets and leaving unsafe environments and feeling that this is their only option. Uh, those with mental and physical health issues, people uh, that feel disenfranchised or uh, affected uh, through discrimination in our community and the list goes on. The best way to describe this level of activity uh, in terms of our response is to imagine yourself in a room at one of our hotspots meetings. The City of Melbourne started the weekly hotspots, sorry, um, bringing together what had been or might otherwise have been seen as unlikely partners. Uh, and now council officers, police and support services meet regularly to discuss places where there are regular rough sleepers, the specific locations and the specific people. And I am calling out Dean Robertson in our team who leads that. Uh, and uh, we've got Craig Peel and Giovanni Traviani who are from the police who work so closely with us uh, in such a caring way uh, to make a difference to those people. The gathering for the hotspots meetings is closely links, linked with service coordination uh, and project uh, which we run with the Victorian government and about 14 other local agencies. And those at the service coordination meetings, hotspots generally know every single person living on the streets of Melbourne, which is extraordinary and another reflection of us as a caring city. We are familiar with each individual struggle to find housing, sometimes their drug and alcohol abuse, their mental health issues or whatever circumstance it is that is keeping them on the streets. Finding these people, connecting with them, brings them into the orbit of the City of Melbourne's daily support team and other assertive outreach services. So the hotspots, together with service coordination meetings, are really at the front line and making a difference. Now, it's not that these meetings are always easy or indeed the actions following uh, the meetings are easy, but the dedicated teams working together uh, keep going and assure themselves that they're on the right track. And I know that um, we've got lots of people here that can share more detail about, uh, about the way in which that process is working and, and the sorts of results that we're seeing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of housing, all of you here at the com conference have specific roles to play uh, when we discuss the issue of homelessness. Um, you may have broad responsibilities, you may have more narrow direct responsibilities. And at local government level, it's frustrating in many ways that we directly uh, don't uh, provide and not responsible for housing. So it's the way in which we work together with you all to create those outcomes that's so important. What we can do and do with renewed purpose is put people on the right path to find housing. It might take the daily support team workers 60 or more conversations with somebody until we can get them to the point of accepting an offer of permanent accommodation, an offer that is based on their needs and reflects the right outcome for them. Uh, having been out at various times of the night myself and uh, being involved in some of these discussions, uh, it really is that individual uh, pursuit of an outcome uh, that is so important. So it is sometimes through unlikely partnerships and a determination to reach every person sleeping on the streets uh, that we can have an impact. We're so heartened that again this year, so many volunteers helped us with the 2018 street count in Melbourne. It also uh, involved a number of agencies such as Launch who organised and coordinated us. Uh, it was terrific to collaborate across several local government areas with other councils, homelessness organisations and again with the Victoria Police. And on what was a really cold mid-winter night, uh, 400 volunteers uh, set out at 3am uh, to visit parks, streets and laneways in five local government areas to talk to the people who were sleeping and who are sleeping rough 
if they would allow us to ask as many questions as we could to collect valuable data that we can use then uh, to develop new and support continuing uh, policies and initiatives. The results, as I said, are invaluable because they're real and they come from the people themselves. And pleasingly, the 2018 street count revealed a 15% decrease since 2016 in the number of people sleeping within the CBD of Melbourne. We know we've got a lot more to do, but it's great that it's heading in the right direction. So it fell the number from 247 people because we're talking about individuals here, not uh, percentage statistics, 247 people to 210 people. So we've still got a way to go, but as I said, it's moving in the right direction. And it's our sincere hope that in Melbourne, the unprecedented level of coordination amongst the agencies and support services will keep having this positive impact. So, ah, uh, We've found a number of interesting things. We've found that now very few young people are sleeping rough in Melbourne, which is so pleasing to be able to disconnect uh, uh, within uh, that youth group. Uh, and we've no doubt that this is connected with the fantastic work that Front Yard uh, Youth Services provide through Melbourne City Mission. And of course, we're all involved in building that capability at Front Yard Youth Services. Um, what is also evident is the jump in the number of people visiting our nighttime safe space in our city. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to visit uh, the night cafe. If all 800 of you went tonight, that would create quite an uh, interesting uh, situation. Uh, but you'll certainly see something uh, that's very special. Uh, and if you want to know where it is, just ask somebody from Melbourne sitting not far away from you, I'm sure, in the audience. The uh, nighttime safe space, nighttime cafe in itself is not a solution, um, nor is it an alternative at all. I'm not saying that it is. And if you go tonight, you'll see uh, what I mean by that. But at every, every, any given moment, it gives vulnerable people a safe and warm space to come, feel a sense of community, a sense of hope, and have somebody to talk to about what some of those solutions might be for them. And indeed, in terms of some of the future plans, uh, it's about a pathway, a longer term pathway out of homelessness, which will be fantastic. So many agencies are working on better options for permanent housing. We know that the salvos, other partners, government, the private sector, all must be involved in better, faster moves to house rough sleepers and those at risk. Our extensive contacts with people experiencing homelessness and the collaborations we've formed mean that that understanding is better than it's ever been before. We don't have all the answers, but certainly the information we're collecting is helping us with programs that can be offered to many and have impact. But that's why it's also important that we're working with organisations such as Ahuri, who have a uh, uh, other sources of data that are so valuable in helping us build initiatives with our partners that can have a positive impact. The Institute's overview of urban homelessness and the analysis of federal budget measures are extremely useful for many of us, uh, particularly because whilst we don't provide housing directly, we are certainly very involved in advocating uh, for housing solutions, so that's fantastic. And more recently, City of Melbourne has funded seven new projects through the Pathways Innovation Fund, and they really make sense. That's because, as we've said, they've been developed by people who know about homelessness in our city. We can see the gaps that need to be filled whilst housing is still not available. For example, one project recognises that some people who have hospital stays are frequently discharge discharged right back onto the streets and into experiencing homelessness. So how do we surround them with the sort of support to stay well and find housing? And what about those very issues surrounding compliance? Homeless people tell us or have told us that they don't always know how to interpret local laws, so they're not even sure uh, what they're breaching, if you like. Um, and at the moment, thankfully, it's not against the law in Melbourne to sleep rough. Um, but it is still against the law to camp in a public place. 
accumulated items and rubbish attract the attention of law enforcement. So how do we ensure, on the other hand, in terms of that overall experience for everybody uh, that makes up the constituents of Melbourne, we make sure that it's a safe and welcoming place for them to come and work, run their businesses and visit. But the City of Melbourne has heard loud and clear that people don't want those elements of uh, homelessness criminalised and so our response is adjusted to make sure that it's a caring response and not something that is seem, seems merely to be enforcing rules for the sake of enforcing rules. So while protecting public amenity is definitely our responsibility, our laws are not there to needlessly kick people out of spaces that they feel are safe or that they need, even if it's in the short term. We're here to help all people in our city. Another new program aims to help, uh, in, help uh, people experiencing homeless interpret those local laws by boosting, uh, it says here, the legal skills of those seemingly trapped in homelessness. I'm not sure about legal skills, but certainly uh, the knowledge of how to uh, utilise the legal system to help them. And pets, well, who wants to make a choice uh, when housing uh, is offered and animals are forbidden. And that's why we have a free pet foster program, for example, being developed to help the homeless be able to secure housing and focus on that, but make sure that their pets are also well care cared for and loved. And a commitment I made, as I said earlier, before being elected was uh, to install lockers around people for, sorry, around Melbourne for people that are homeless and we are currently working on appropriate city sites which are safe and where services can be provided. So we're getting on with this. We're working with over 50 homelessness agencies um, to, um, to, to make sure we get some good outcomes on storage. Uh, and uh, you'll hear more of this in the short term. Uh, we also want to join in more discussions with the private sector. I'm not sure to, around this room today how many people are here from the private sector? would you say if you put your hands up? Not enough, and that's what we're focused on. Thank you for being here. It's so important that we get cross-sector support on these issues, uh, and that was a really big uh, message that I had back to me. Melbourne is a caring city, wants to be a generous city, but unsure from the private sector where to put uh, the investment to make the biggest impact. So we have a, uh, a round table coming up where we can start to harness understanding guide where that private sector investment is going and could go to make the biggest impact. So Melbourne is undoubtedly a generous city. I've probably said it 20 times during this speech, so I hope you believe me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to finish on an emotive note. The Salvo's Brendan Nottle, whose incredible work will be well known to many of you, has spoken in the past about embedding strong values in a community where potentially homelessness can be ignored and resented. That's not what we want. In a city with all of the advantages and prosperity enjoyed by many, surely we can have respect for every single person in our city, and that's what it's about. Showing compassion, especially for the most disadvantaged, is the mark of a city with such values. Brendan suggests, actually demands of me, uh, and he urges acceptance and appreciation of difference instead of fear and neglect, and I'm completely signed up for that. Few people could put it better. It's my conviction that, conviction, I should say that, with conviction, that our city is a place for everybody, and that's what we are working towards. I see these values demonstrated every day, and we'll just keep working to make sure that we're doing what we can to protect our city's most vulnerable. Thank you so much for listening to me this afternoon, for letting me be part of this, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our experts and the questions during the panel session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord Mayor. Um, we are now going to turn to a, one of our poll questions. Um, if you have your app ready and your phone ready, if you found your lost phone and hop on the app. Um, here is the question. The most important role for local government in addressing homelessness is A, providing support that is focused on ensuring safe communities. 
B, working with state and federal governments around the provision of housing. C, outreach and support to the homeless by coordinating multi-agency responses. Or D, stay out of the issue. <laughs> Could have said D, all of the above. Yeah, or E, all of the above, except for D. <laughs> Got 10 seconds to plug in your answer. Some very exciting music. <laughs> and the results. Um, so, two really strong responses there. Um, outreach and support to homeless people by coordinating multi-agency responses. But first place, working with state and federal governments around the provision of housing, which just goes to the vital importance of housing. Um, in, in solving homelessness. Um, terrific. So we'll now turn to our panellists. Um, next up, we have Monique Wiseman from Wayside Chapel. Oh, here we are. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the land in which we meet and pay my respects to elders both past present and emerging, and also any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. Um, yes, that is that is me. Um, I, I, I'm not very good at this. this, is not my part of forte either, so I might just click on, we'll just keep going. Um, yeah, let's get to the point, I think. Um, who, who would have thought, and I, I, I just want to uh, share with you just for one minute, um, one moment, I should say, um, that being homelessness would make you being feeling like you are a criminal. Um, let me tell you, that's what's happening in New South Wales, in the inner city. Um, as I'm down here, that's what's happening uh, today, and every other day it has been for probably the last 12 to 18 months. Many of you, in which would have heard, uh, there was a, a big outcry because there was a tent city that was placed um, in Martin Place, which is obviously home to uh, our financial services in Sydney, but also uh, Parliament House is just uh, right there. Uh, so that was incredible inconvenience for people to get to and from work when you're tripping over a tent or a homeless person. Um, but there was never a question on why they chose that uh, location, because there's been many locations within the inner city for a very long time, um, which has meant that it's just a different focus point. So what then it became uh, was a bit of political warfare. Um, and I'm going to be really, really polite in saying it became down to local government and state government on um, who was the bigger person I'm just going to keep it very polite um, and I'll, I'll leave you to imagine beyond that uh, because what it meant was it was two individuals of trying to uh, beat down on, you know, I've been here for this long and I'm here in this position. Um, but the reality was we're talking about a human aspect and it's individuals. It's why there is this many people in the room today because it is, it's a national issue, but it's also a human rights issue. Uh, we have right to shelter. Now what that looks like, uh, does it mean that it has to be bricks and mortar? Uh, no, not necessarily. Some people choose a different sort of dwelling, um, depending on where you reside. But the impact that it has on an individual, because any one of us could be there, but does it make it that you become a criminal through that process. Um, when I talk about, you know, when we're trying to work together, I suppose, not only with agencies, and I've got many of my peers that I walk alongside uh, very proudly from the interstate. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be kind. Um, but it's the reality of not really knowing how and why a lot of people got there. We've seen in the last, you know, first quarter actually of this year to the second quarter, an increase of 31% accessing our service. People would say that's a testament. I'd say that's an incredible uh, reality of what we're not getting right 
within our government, um, both at state and local level, um, and voices are not being heard, and actions are not actually happening. Um, when you're getting move on policies on a daily basis, when you're getting your, your, your livelihoods thrown out, you know, what provides, you know, your, your basic, your IDs, um, identification, just to feel like you're human, um, it's pretty demoralising on where do you go and where do you go to next. We've had, um, I probably should do a bit of the slide thing, shouldn't I? Because that might sort of go to how I'm sort of talking here. Um, so there we go, we spoke about a bit like the Martin Place stuff. Um, but hang on. Clearly, this is not my forte. You can see that. I suppose it, when it, you know, highlighting the negative attitude. But what has happened in the inner city um, is the fact that we have got groups and organisations coming together, but it's a band-aid approach. And I say that um, sadly because so many of our um, brothers and sisters, doesn't matter from wherever you come from. Um, they're being placed in housing and in places that is not their community. It doesn't make it a home by placing them, it's ticking a box because you've done that work, you know, of getting them, you know, it's sort of a quick approach to clearing the streets, but it's then putting them in places where they don't have the services to then have the aftercare. And I think that's the biggest complex issue is the aftercare, because there's so much more than having a home. Um, one of the guys we just housed just recently, the first time, he's 42 years of age, and he said to me, I've got a startup package, and I said, oh, that's fantastic, what does it look like? He goes, I've got one plate, one cup. I go, oh, I, I thought I could come out for a feed. Um, so where, where are we going with that? They must well be in a four by two cell, without experiencing what normal reality is for each and every one of us. Um, I've got to try and be positive to some point um, through this. Why? <laughs> Say it like it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I think it comes down to real partnerships with both police and the greater, um, you know, governments. When we talk about police force, and, you know, I, I'm probably the most unpopular person in King's Cross for many different reasons, because I'm sort of at the station more than I'm sitting at my desk um, advocating for our mob, because the simple fact that it takes them that long to actually come in the door to see me from uh, King's Cross Station to Wayside Chapel, it takes five minutes. But it usually takes them 25 minutes to half an hour after they've been searched um, just by trying to access service and going forward in being able to achieve what we all would like to see, a, a positive outcome. Um, and I think, you know, that's the real uh, sadness that we, we, we face as frontline workers because we don't have the answers unless we've got ongoing partnerships with the right people. Um, when, when I look around the room and when I, we saw the first figures of where everyone's come from, and most of the people have come from interstate, um, you know, we're at a, an Australian, this only happens once every four years. Um, that's very, very sad, because those, those numbers are rising because service provision is stopping in so many areas, in regional and remote, and that's why we suffer urban drift. You know, I, I shouldn't say we suffer, uh, <laughs> but you know, that's why they're coming into the cities. But what are they coming into? Um, they're not coming into to much at all because we, we haven't got the support. And we need to sort of network in a way that is the reality of why and how can we change. And I, I, I suppose I'm gonna leave you on that note um, because being homeless does not make you a criminal. You have every right. We all walk this land together. It doesn't matter where we are. We all breathe the same air at the end of the day. Um, but we're just brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter how we get there. But we are just one mob. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Monique. Um, turning to turning back to Melbourne, um, I'll now introduce Lucy Adams. Good afternoon, everyone. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on. I pay my respects to the elders, past and present, the leaders of the future. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. As we have heard from our Lord Mayor this afternoon, and as many of in, you in the room will know, just over 18 months ago, in January 2017, Melbourne found itself under pressure and tempted by the same thing that many cities around the world have found themselves tempted by, which is to use tougher laws to respond to an increasing number of people sleeping on our streets. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is reflect briefly on how we as a city and as a community found ourselves in that position, but also how we responded across um, sectors, across justice, across homelessness, with our colleagues in Victoria Police, in local government, how we really embraced it as homelessness, as a shared problem that required a shared solution informed by people with a lived experience. And most importantly, I'd like to talk about really where are we now? At, if we have made a public statement that tougher law enforcement is not the way we want to go as a city, how do we really bring that to life? There we go. Now, very sadly, this image will be familiar to many of you. It is just one example of what we experienced in Melbourne at the start of 2017, as many of us were just settling back into the year. Um, the Lord Mayor has mentioned the figures. There had been a significant increase in the number of people sleeping on our streets of 74% over two years and it was almost 250 people who were spending the nights on the streets. We also had the eyes of sports lovers of the world on us with the Australian Open and we had some very dedicated and very negative media attention. There was initially very strong leadership and a strong response um, to that criticism and that came in the form of senior members of Victoria Police saying it's not a crime to be homeless and moving people on isn't the solution. Also the former Lord Mayor at the time said we've seen cities around the world that bundle people up and ship them out and that's not the kind of city that we want to be. But in the face of further pressure and further media coverage like this, and some contrary views um, amongst senior members of Victoria Police that in fact laws weren't tough enough and maybe questioning um, how genuine people were and referring, relying more on stereotypes or feeding this idea that maybe we needed something stronger. And within 24 hours of that, it was announced that the City of Melbourne would be considering tougher laws. Now, I don't go into this detail to rehash um, trodden ground, really to say that this is something that can happen in any of our communities and these are the kinds of pressures that decision makers find themselves under and the things that we, which, whichever sector we're from, um, need to be alive to. That if you've got increasing numbers of people sleeping rough, if you've got negative media coverage, if we have not claimed a leadership role in explaining homelessness and who it affects and why, we all can find ourselves vulnerable to that kind of reactive knee-jerk response that doesn't leave time to pause and contemplate the evidence and really reflect on the kind of city that we want to be. What was proposed um, was a local law, it wasn't at state level, and it was an, um, a broadening of the ban on camping, which already exists, and um, a new provision in relation to leaving items unattended. And both of those offences would have carried a fine of $250, but also could have um, led to charges or move on powers. Um, as you have already heard today, um, the response was rapid from across the community of Melbourne, from across Victoria. There was a lot of concern about those proposals. And I'm going to step briefly through the top five concerns. Um, and I think it's important because I think it is important that whatever, um, whatever sector we're part of, we have them at our fingertips so that if we do find ourselves again under pressure to go down that path, we're really clear on why it's not the way to go. And so the first one and the most obvious one is the effect that tougher laws have on people experiencing homelessness and the way that entrenches isolation and increases vulnerability. And when we say this, we're drawing from our day-to-day -day experience, um, and I'm also drawing from international evidence. I've had 
the, the real privilege of doing a research fellowship on this issue and I've looked at other cities um, trying to grapple with homelessness and that clash and pressure to, um, to crack down or to use enforcement-based approaches. I've spoken with 60 different people in nine different cities and two studies that really stood out for me. One was in Denver in Colorado and they went down a similar path with a ban on camping. And after doing that, the university spoke with 512 people experiencing homelessness and two thirds of them said that since that law was introduced, they were less safe, they were further from the city, further from services um, because they were trying to avoid um, that, that law enforcement response. Two thirds of 512 people. But the other one that has really stayed with me and that I, will, I do not think I will ever forget um, is, came out of Canada and it was a, an inquiry that was commissioned in 2010. And that inquiry was commissioned because in early 2000s a number of women had gone missing um, and were later found to have been killed and were even later, much too late, found to have been killed by the same perpetrator. And there was a very significant inquiry into what failings had led to a situation where many women experiencing homelessness or living in Vancouver's equivalent of our rooming houses, um, living really on the margins for some point of their at some point in their life, how so many people could go missing. And there were a number of findings. There, was, there were 1,500 pages. There were 63 recommendations. But one of those was that these women had a number of outstanding warrants and fines um, as a result of poverty-related offending including jaywalking, including begging, including drinking in public. And because of that, they were isolated and their relationship of trust with police had broken down. And that amplified their vulnerability. There were two express recommendations made on this point and one, and I really, I do feel like our own city and our own local police are trying to embrace these insights, but one was that a real reflection is made on um, reducing the number of fines and charges issued as a direct result of homelessness and poverty and some really clear guidelines around um, when discretion should be used and when it is when we do rely on the law and when it's really a service-based response that we need. So um, that is a powerful learning I think that should be held on to by any decision makers thinking of going down that path because it's a fairly upsetting one. Um, the the second of our concerns is really about the justice system. We know how much pressure it is under. There were more articles on the weekend. It is overwhelmed. And by using our law enforcement tools, we are pushing people into an already overwhelmed justice system. And again, one of the studies I came across, um, I think we hear a lot about it. It's really expensive to respond with housing and services, but we should not delude ourselves that it is free or that it is cheap to go down a law enforcement path. So. The, the Canadian study, again, they've done some great work, um, looked at 10 years of the offence of begging and squeegeeing and how it had been enforced over a 10 year period. They only looked at police time and the injection of police resources, not courts, but what they found is 67,000 fines had been issued for these two offences. And that took about 15 minutes per, per fine. Um, and it was 16,000 hours of time all up which came at a cost of $930,000, almost a million dollars. Um, and then they looked at it and $8,000 of the fines had been paid. <laughs> so even if you apply a purely fiscal lens to this very human problem, it doesn't make sense from that point of view either. Um, I, the third one is um, the strain it can place on enforcement officers. And this is something that we've heard from Victoria Police or from local council that it's a really tough job being frontline responders. And before I went on my fellowship, one um, member of Victoria Police said, look, we're under a lot of pressure to respond because we're out there 24 seven and people experiencing homelessness are also out there 24 seven and we're not always the best place to respond. And that was something that was echoed in my international research. A assistant commissioner in Washington DC said, look, we don't have the skills we need. And she expressly said, some of the money that's going to us needs to go into services. So um, I guess another insight from overseas that I think is illuminating. Um, the, the fourth, um, and this did not escape the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing, but there is a very real human rights issue with going down an enforcement-based approach to homelessness. 
um, she called it out on the international stage um, and made an official communication to the Australian government. But I think what that did um, in her complaint and her concerns and the media that received, it really just reminded us to reflect on some of the things the Lord Mayor spoke about, which is, was that really the kind of city that we wanted to be? And equally for the cities and the communities that you come from, I think that's a really good thing to draw upon is that strength and generosity that does lie in most, most communities. And then the final one, the headline item really, is the sheer ineffectiveness of trying to use criminalisation and a law enforcement approach to respond to homelessness. And the poster child of, of failure, really, um, at that time was Los Angeles. They had the toughest, some of the toughest laws cracking down on people, with, people experiencing homelessness. And at the same time, they had the highest concentration of people sleeping on the streets in the United States. And it's actually, um, they've still got some progress to be made, but under new leadership and a new mayor, they are really making some significant strides toward alternative responses, drawing on the strength of the community um, and with a housing focused response. But really back then, they were an example of that idea that um, cracking down on people experiencing homelessness will not deliver the solution that anybody is seeking. So that's all quite negative. They're all the risks, they're all the concerns. Um, but what we wanted to do when it came to the fore in Melbourne um, was really take a more positive, more constructive approach and to say, look, this is a, this is, um, this is a problem uh, that is affecting all members of the community, but it is not a problem without a solution. And so what we pulled together, and it was informed by people with a direct experience of homelessness, and it was ultimately endorsed by 54 different organisations across housing, homelessness, justice, faith-based communities. But it was a short alternative response to homelessness in the inner city. And it did draw on this idea that already the city of Melbourne had played such a great leadership role and had pioneered some really impressive programs um, and that we really needed to, um, I guess, stand our ground or hold on to that. And while local government alone can never be the sole responder or the sole, um, I have all the answers to homelessness, they can play a vital leadership role both in the services provided, the collaboration, the, the service coordination, and in the advocacy and messaging and leadership. So the kinds of things that this um, framework included are many things that were already being done and needed to be continued or some things that could be tweaked. And they included the very short term things like safe spaces, like storage for people. Um, always the headline, as you already heard today and you will hear again, is, um, housing first, as it's often called, but it is long term, it's appropriate housing for the person with the level of support that they need and it's social housing, it's affordable for them on their income. And in between, there are a series of things like an amazing program that the City of Melbourne runs with council to homeless persons um, and people with a lived experience called Connect Respect. And it is people who have experienced homelessness working with business to help them understand the experience of homelessness and how it can affect people's day-to-day um, -day lives. And the aim of that really is to reduce some of the appetite that can come sometimes otherwise arise from business for tougher law enforcement approaches if that understanding and empathy isn't necessarily there. So where did we get to um, throughout, I guess, that what was almost 12 months, we got to a point where the City of Melbourne ran a really um, genuine and thorough consultation. And as the Lord Mayor has said, what that showed is that this actually tougher law, it wasn't what the community was calling for. And I think amongst our different communities, we need to be really alive to that, not to misread or misunderstand um, a community call for something to be done as a community call for a crackdown or tougher laws. And because what happened was two and a half thousand people responded to this consultation and they did it through, um, through surveys or through submissions and 84% said that they didn't support the proposed laws. So that real outpouring of, I guess, um, generosity, th strength of community um, was something that came out very strongly. Um, partly um, in response to that, the laws were put on hold and have since been um, shelved. 
um, which is something that we can commend the City of Melbourne for, really, um, and the community that really got behind the alternative responses. Um, <laughs> um, there has been an operating protocol, um, I know the Lord Mayor drew on that language of protocol that has been in place instead um, and that is a protocol between Victoria Police and the City of Melbourne and I think that is still a work in progress in terms of un really people who are sleeping rough understanding what that means and how that affects them day to day and what their rights and responsibilities and options are in relation to that protocol. Um, we've also seen significant activity at the state level and I'm sure you'll hear more about the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Plan and then a number of the things that the Lord Mayor has touched on, the really positive injections of leadership that local government can play in terms of coordinating services and um, connect respect and significant investments in innovative responses to homelessness. Um, that leaves us with where are we now? It looks like a lot of text on that slide, but um, essentially I think um, while positively reflecting on what was a very near miss, um, I think we also need to remember that there are still a, a real abundance of laws uh, that can negatively affect people experiencing homelessness because they're living their lives in public places and carrying out every element of their their private life um, in the public eye, essentially. So in Victoria, it's still a kind to beg. There are broad reaching amenity provisions in our local laws. Um, there are still a number of ways in which people can find themselves caught up in law enforcement mechanisms of fining, of charging, of moving people on, of having belongings confiscated. And I think to really appreciate and understand that we do need to have direct insights from people who are caught up in it currently and, what, and to understand what is their current experience of, of enforcement and of approaches and we need to understand the, the, um, the solutions and the, the way forward uh, from that perspective. Um, I think just to finish up, the role for leadership and clear communication and messaging really like we've heard from the Lord Mayor just now, has such an integral role to, uh, and vital role to play. And I think firstly, um, it's, it's crucial that we're communicating respectfully and clearly uh, with people experiencing homelessness about what their um, rights are, what their options are, what their responsibilities are. That kind of consistency of communication should flow through to people who are enforcing laws so that laws can be enforced in a way that is fair and that is consistent with Victoria's human rights protections. Um, and then finally, um, that communication needs to flow outward to the community. For people who aren't working in homelessness day to day, people who aren't living it or aren't on the front lines in another way, they do need to understand homelessness and they do need to be brought along to be part of effective and proven solutions to homelessness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, to round out uh, our speakers for this afternoon and before we turn over to your questions, um, I'll invite David Pearson to the stage. I'll just put that up a bit. Um, unlike the speaker earlier today who said that your speeches should be as long as you are tall, I won't be this long. Um, but we have heard about a few sort of negative experiences today and uh, Rosalind asked me to be the positive guy on the panel and cheer you up a little bit. So whilst it's not all beer and skittles in Adelaide, what I'm going to talk to you about is the project that we've, um, uh, we've been working on over the last little while. Uh, and it was really born out of a desire to avoid the kind of criminalisation that you've just heard a fair bit about. So the Dunstan Foundation, uh, we describe, we used to call ourselves a think tank, um, but we now call ourselves a, a collaborative organisation that works on thought leadership projects. So um, that gives you some insight into what we work on. But we, um, we run a homelessness conference every year. Uh, two years ago, Roseanne Haggerty from the US came out. Some of you may know her. She sort of helped pioneer the common ground solution, common ground housing model and now works on the now leads the organisation Community Solutions. And so we were really inspired by her speech at that conference and she challenged us and said, look, Adelaide is one of the most livable cities in the world. You've got a challenge with homelessness, but it's manageable. And we have a model that we've used that will help uh, with that. And so she set a challenge and a year later at our homelessness conference, we launched the Adelaide Zero project to sort of meet that challenge. And it's based on this community solutions approach that is called Functional Zero. 
So many, has, has many people here heard of the functional zero approach? You can pop your hands up, just out of interest. Yep, so a fair few. So it, it started, um, I guess they started with this campaign they had called the 100,000 Homes Campaign. And they built 100,000 homes and they waited for the data to come out to show, look how much is homelessness reduced by? They thought hopefully about 100,000. And when the data came out, they were pretty shocked. It wasn't even close. It was 20,000 people roughly that they'd reduced homelessness by. And they realised that this count up goal to 100,000 homes is just counting up to outputs of how many people they're processing through the system. But the problem was the system was broken. The bucket, as it were, had holes in it. And people were cycling in and out and uh, they needed to count down to the goal of zero homelessness. But homelessness is a dynamic problem. And so they needed a dynamic measure for how do you measure that? Because you can end homelessness on Monday and if somebody falls into homelessness on Tuesday, voila, you've failed. Um, so they needed a measure that, that was actually robust enough to be able to determine that. And so that's where this functional zero model came in. Uh, they've been doing it for a number of years now. And what this slide shows is that seven communities across the US have functionally ended and sustained that end to veterans homelessness in the US. And a further three have gone on to do it for chronic homelessness. So these are communities in the US with a social safety net that is way less than ours. Uh, that have achieved this goal with measurable data. Um, and they are sort of, the communities are what we'd consider local government areas. So Rockford's just outside of Chicago, the first one. Arlington, they focused legitimately on veterans as the US and that's just inside Washington DC. Bergen County's just outside of New York. Many of the other cities that you'll, the regions there are in cities you'll know, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Oklahoma City. So this is a model that we were inspired by. We thought this could work. Um, so what we did is we set about mapping the system. And this is the system that isn't working. Uh, and the functional zero measure is basically that if you can make sure that if there's all the people that are coming into your system, so on the left-hand side, those who are returning from housing because they've fallen out of it, those who are newly identified or those who returned from, active, uh, in, from being inactive, uh, that's your inflow. And if you can make sure that your outflow is those going to housing is more than's coming in from your inflow, you're on your way to achieving functional zero. Now to actually get to functional zero, you have to reduce that number in the middle. And you have to know everyone who's in the middle. You need to know them by name. And that's the way the model works. Uh, so we were inspired by that as a positive option. And at the same time we were hearing about all this, everything that you've just been hearing about in Sydney and Melbourne was happening in Australia as well. And we said to ourselves, well look, we are at this pivot point. We can either try and go down the route of the US and um, use this functional zero model, or we can end up with this increasing criminalisation of a problem uh, that really shouldn't be criminalised. And, the, and the, the sort of response that we saw in Melbourne and Sydney was what we were seeing at the time. And really what it's showing is that it wasn't working for anyone. No one in the system wanted this. The police officers were saying the same things that they were saying in other places. This is, you know, move on powers don't work. This isn't a criminal problem. Uh, you know, crime isn't actually increasing despite the fear of crime increasing. All these sorts of things. Uh, the business community were not uh, very happy about it in our city of Adelaide. This has become an issue for us as well. And so what we wanted to do was create a system um, that would respond to this because uh, we knew this problem was coming and sure enough it did. So this is uh, not just the criminalisation of homelessness in Adelaide. These are some images of the victimisation or the vilification of homelessness in South Australia. These images were taken off, um, they're deliberately blurred, but they were taken off one of the residents associations websites in South Australia and were given a good run in the media as well. And it's just some Aboriginal people enjoying their day to day life on one of our busy streets. But um, what they did is they put it up and described this as the good, the bad and the ugly that's going on on Hutt Street Centre and Hutt Street, which is one of the sort of, it's a bit like Ligon Street in Melbourne kind of thing. And uh, it was a campaign that was run by the Residents Association because they were frustrated with the fact that this problem wasn't being dealt with. And they were in a part of the city where, because of the changing nature of trade and retail and everything else, most of the shops have closed down in this part of town. And there was some legitimate problems, but it started leading towards the vilification of the people who were actually very vulnerable. Or in some cases in these photos doing absolutely nothing wrong. Um, so we wanted to avoid this problem and we've seen it come already. So that's the cautionary note from us. But what we really wanted to focus on was the positives because Adelaide is one of the most livable cities in the world. And while Melbourne does come out first, we are down about fourth, second only in Australia. We are the most affordable city in the country as well. <laughs> and we are uh, recognised by Lonely Planet as one of the most livable cities, one of the most visible cities as well. So we're very proud. <laughs> we're very proud of our city, but we do want to work together to solve this problem. Uh, and so we focus on our city and we focus on rough sleeping. Uh, and not because rough sleeping is the most 
you know, important form of homelessness, just as the, in America they focused on veterans. Not that veterans are more deserving than any other form of homelessness, but in the US it's pretty obvious why they focused on veterans with the culture they have there. Uh, and we focused in Adelaide based on the fact that South Australia, as many of you know, has got this sort of image as a Rust Belt state, and I'm clearly a very proud South Australian, but the city of Adelaide has been the vibrancy of it and the re rejuvenation of our city has been the vehicle by which we've sought to turn around that image of our state. And we were doing a lot of work on that and we we're getting all these international uh, accolades. But how do we continue to be proud about that if we've got this problem on the streets of our city? So it was a way of making homelessness relevant to a much broader audience than um, the group that's in this hall today. It's sort of being here with 800 people is very cool, but it doesn't happen very often. Uh, we often go back to our local communities and we struggle to get attention on this issue. So uh, it was that focus was one of the ways in which we did that. So moving on, we built a coalition. So uh, we got all of, almost all of the inner city service providers, the government agencies, the universities provide a lot of support, got the private sector to help us support this, um, to, to sign on to this goal. And we broke the project up into a number of phases. So we said we'd design it, so we went through a rapid design process, did a 90 day change project where we got the state, local government, uh, all the service providers together to say, what does this project look like? How are we going to make this goal that we've set for ourselves? Or we actually came up with a goal through that process. And we've now moved into the second phase of the project, which is implementing it. We hope we'd achieve our goal of functional zero street homelessness in the city by the end of 2020. Uh, and then we hope to sustain it in phase three. And phase four, maybe it will become, you know, not quite so linear, but phase four is to expand this model. We know that we want to prove what this is, what we're trying to do here. As a, it's an experiment, really. And we want to try and make sure that by using data and understanding and knowing everyone by name that we can actually change the outcomes for this group of people. And we want to do it for other cohorts, so not just street homelessness and not just in the city. So importantly, uh, the homelessness sector likes meetings. So this is our government structure. Uh, it was much more complicated than this before, I'll give you that. Uh, and so what we did is we went through and we found out where all the meetings were, what everyone was going, and all these meetings that people aren't talking to each other and all the rest of it. And we streamlined it a bit. And the blue box in the middle is what we call our project steering group. That's the, that's the decision making group. Above it, we have a strategic advisory group, which the, the Lord Mayor of the City of Adelaide chairs, along with our housing minister in the South Australian government. Uh, and we all report up. Um, we're all accountable through the system, but decisions are made at that blue box in the middle. So when we get data on what's happening in our homelessness system, that data is owned by the community and it's decided at the project steering group at which government sits as an equal partner with everyone else. So when the data comes out and there's an election around the corner, we don't sit on the data anymore, we still put it out because it's probably the most important time to put it out. Uh, all the working groups help us work through different projects. Um, there's more information about this on our website because I know that's very small. And really the, the change theory that we came up with or the theory of change that we're working on is collective impact. Um, well, we're informed by collective impact. Can I do another show of hands? Is any, who knows what collective impact is? Yeah, majority as well. So we, it really says that you've got to come up with a common agenda, you have a common measurement tool, you have everyone working on re mutually reinforcing activities, we constantly communicate, and you have an organisation who makes sure it all happens. Uh, and that's what the Dunstan Foundation does. So this isn't our project, the Zero Project, it is the South Australian Communities Project, and we all work on it together. Um, and uh, we try to move along that spectrum, which this graph is a little hard to see, but we, there's so many forces in society that force us to compete. And what we want to do is not just coexist or just communicate, but we want to cooperate, coordinate, collaborate, and integrate our actions. So we want to move down that spectrum of how we're working together to solve this problem. So we're trying to work together differently. And that's what we've been doing for about a year now. We've been doing the hard work of collaboration to try and put this housing first model into action. And so we've come up with all these principles and the different components of the project. And um, we've got some researchers who've informed this whole project that um, have taken the best experience from what's going on around the world. Researchers associated with Hahuri. Um, and then we put an accountability framework together, which is we basically allocated all the jobs because there's a lot to do. Uh, so um, I won't go through all of them, but sort of uh, the Anglicare, for example, is doing a lot of work on housing. Uniting Communities is doing a lot of work on how do we coordinate care. Uh, Nimai National has managed our by name list. One of the street housing providers, uh, one of the um, street services providers, uh, the Hutt Street Centre did our Connections Week, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, so we set a target as well, which I mentioned before, and we uh, luckily had an election around the corner, so we got every political party to sign onto it, which they did, which was nice. Um, and we tried to tr do innovative approaches to dealing with this challenge. So our housing agency 
rather than um, the only option when you see someone who's on the street um, is calling the police, we created, a, the, the housing department created this new app called Street Connect, which we're launching later this week, which is where you can get your iPhone out, drop a pin, and it'll send an assertive outreach service to go and have a conversation with those people rather than sending the police to go and try and move them on. So you can do that without ever having to have a conversation if you don't want to, or you can if you like, but it's a, it's a technology-based app service that's being launched. Um, but one of the most important things we did is we did a Connections Week, or what many call a um, Registry Week. And we went out and counted every single person, uh, and we used a common assessment tool, and we did that, the VI Split app, and we identified how many people were sleeping rough in Adelaide. So this is the data of rough sleeping in the city of Adelaide. Um, and it's 143 people was what we identified at Connections Week. Uh, and the, the sort of, you can see from 2007 to 2009, when all the Rudd government's work was happening and there was a the social inclusion initiative in the South Australian government showed that you can make a big difference. We took it from 108 to 40 people in 2009. Uh, and then it's jumped around quite a lot and it's higher now than it's ever been. Uh, and what it shows though is not that this is a tidal wave of a problem that sometimes is described as, it's actually quite a manageable problem. And in fact, if you wanna build a coalition of organizations and people and businesses and communities that are gonna support this problem rather than react to the problem and react in a way that leads to the criminalization, we, we wanna make sure that people can wrap their head around this problem and think, hang on, 143 people, that's, that's nothing. That's, you know, that's one hotel, book it out for the night and you're done. You know, like it's not a big problem. Uh, now, of course, simple solutions like book the hotel room out for a night is not going to fix the problem, but it helps people think that this problem is much more manageable than it really is. Um, and so we did our Connections Week, we found it out, and, and this is all the data that shows, but the bit that I think is the most disturbing part is down the bottom there, which is 30% of the people who are in our system have been sleeping rough for two years. Um, this is not a problem of a lack of housing. This is a problem of a system not working. Now, of course, we need more housing. Um, but we ought to be able to find, South Australia has more public housing per capita than anywhere else in the country, and we can't find housing for the 30% of the 143 people who've been sleeping rough for two years. Our system is broken, uh, and we need to fix the system, and we need to get more housing, and we don't need to have an argument about which one we do first, we need to do both. Um, so that's, that's where we're at as a project. Um, next steps, we're releasing a dashboard to hold everyone accountable, so that will be launched later in the week, which will show how many people are sleeping rough on any given night, to help people wrap their head around this problem. It will show how many people we've housed this month. Uh, and, you know, Bendigo Bank is one of the principal partners in the Zero Projects. We've we sought really hard to get the business community engaged in this, and they're interested in concepts like, how do we put the number of people that are sleeping rough in the window of every bank, and show we're working to reduce this number. Because if people see that number, 143, it is a manageable number. We can do something about that. The community want to be part of solving that problem. Politicians want to be part of solving a problem like that. People want to be associated with something that's working, and that's the frame that we're trying to keep this project in, rather than the respond to a negative issue and the criminalisation issue, which leads you down a path that no one wants to go. So that's our project. Um, we're working on it. We've got a plan. It's not all beer and skittles, but we think we've got a good plan, and we're getting on with it. So thanks very much for having me. Thanks so much, David. I'll turn these down again. Um, we have one of our organisers sitting out the front very anxiously looking at his watch and indicating that we have not a huge amount of time for questions, but um, I know that there will be questions in the audience. There are already some that have come through on the app and you're welcome to send more through. Um, I did want to, though, start with, um, with my own question to the panel, just reflecting on the poll that we had up. Um, I don't know if it's possible to get it up again, um, the poll results. Um, given that we are very lucky to have Melbourne's Lord Mayor with us, I thought it was important to give her the opportunity to respond to that and to say what she thought was the role of local government and should be the, the key priority of local government in addressing homelessness. Okay, well done. Uh, thank you, Ros. And is this working? Good. Uh, I, I quickly wrote down those results as well and uh, really pleased that uh, outreach is recognised as an important role for local government. At the moment in Australia, local government is the most trusted level of local government. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we are at the coalface delivering all sorts of services to members of our community, whether it's maternal health or it's the library or a sporting organisation through to really important issues like homelessness. So using that relationship and the fact that our people are out 
on the streets every day uh, doing uh, lots of different roles means that we have a good opportunity to make a difference working with our um, partners uh, in that outreach uh, and as I said really getting to know each of those for us 210 people living uh, on the streets and working with them individually around solutions. But I was so excited about the government advocacy bit uh, because uh, I'm going to take that back as permission to really go hard <laughs> and uh, one of my favourite things is advocating to state and federal governments. Already been to see the PM and we raised homelessness then. We've already uh, discussed with the federal government what surplus land they may have available within the city of Melbourne, which sadly wasn't much. Uh, but certainly talking with state government about uh, what else we can do uh, around housing. And of course that goes right across the spectrum because a lot of pressure has come because there's just not enough affordable housing, even in that market housing group, all the way through to social housing and then what's available in terms of transition housing and Rob Pradlin's here who's doing a lot to push us on, on that transition housing as well. So uh, very excited to take that as imprimatur on behalf of all of us to advocate even more strongly to state and federal governments and uh, working with organisations around Uhuri because they've got the data. Let's do it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other panellists, other comments on, on the role of local government? Perhaps David, in your experience? Um, yeah, is that one working? Can you hear me? Um, so the City Council was really supportive of what we've been doing. So they helped make sure that we could do our Connections Week um, and they've sat on our project steering group and the Mayor, as I mentioned, has been chairing it. So they've, they've taken a really proactive role. And I think that's been really positive in South Australia at a time when the role of local government's been in the spotlight locally. We're having a debate about rate capping and where, you know, the view is that councils should stick to the roads, the rubbish and keeping rates low. Um, I actually don't agree and this is one of the areas where the council's had a really strong role in just the moral leadership and the convening power that councils can have. It's not necessarily just as a funder but just to bring people together and they've done an amazing job on that. I like that, moral leadership and convening power. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, not every problem needs to be legislated, you know, I love it's it. <laughs> funded away. It can be dealt with through collaboration. Um, so another question for David um, coming through on the app. What is the plan for housing those identified in Connections Week as part of the Zero Project? Yeah, so we're prioritising um, the people who've been identified through the Connections Week. We created a by name list. Um, when, when that list was created, there was a vulnerability score put next to people and we said that we're going to place the people who are the most vulnerable first. Now, that's all well and good in theory and we're going to continue to do that and that will help us deal with the problem of 30% of our rough sleepers being on the streets for two years. That's a really good problem to fix. Um, but we can't just do that forever because it will create perverse incentives or perverse outcomes. So we need to get more housing into the system as well uh, and we need to do some more work on that. We've got a researcher who's in the audience who's doing most of the work on that at the moment, so sorting it out. Terrific. <laughs> um, we are open to questions from the audience as well. If anyone um, has a burning question, feel free to pop your hand up. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that's come through on the app um, is about um, at what threshold do we think homelessness as a phenomenon becomes a crisis or starts to be called a crisis and what impact does this have on regional homelessness? Um, I think it's quite an interesting question, so I'm just going to throw it to you. Lucy? Mm. Um, look, I think if we've got um, 116,000 people experiencing homelessness in a wealthy developed country, we are well within our rights to call it a crisis. Um, I also think though that you don't want to be paralysed by the idea of it being a crisis. So probably what is the important qualifier here is that um, it's a, we've got a crisis, but it isn't a crisis without a solution. And some of those solutions in, in terms of regional communities as well, um, I think what we have to be careful is that we're not, um, the crisis isn't solely attached to people who are experiencing the most visible form of homelessness who are sleeping on our streets. It is people who are sleeping on other people's couches, sleeping in their cars, in rooming houses, and that um, applies across the board. So I think we just have to be careful that the talk of crisis doesn't um, diminish the range of the options that are available to us. Absolutely, and I'm really delighted to see a reference to regional homelessness, which I think is also a very important part of the picture of how we understand and respond to homelessness. Um, any audience questions? I can see someone over here. 
Hi, I'm Helen. Uh, lived experience for um, PESS, Peer Education Support Program through the Council of Homeless Persons and uh, Lived Experience Action Group from North Housing. Where is the lived experience in all aspects of your organisations? Because they've got a lot of um, information and tools that they can provide and, you know, we're more than um, people without a home. Great question. Thanks, Helen. Challenge. I don't know if Beverly Pinder wants to answer on behalf of the City of Melbourne. You do? So uh, we've got um, a steering group and on that steering group, Beverly's just saying there are five people with lived experience, some of them currently, uh, and absolutely brilliant to have them involved. Uh, it's an amazing commitment by them uh, that we value uh, and the data that they're able to bring uh, is uh, invaluable. So um, information and, and the reality, I shouldn't say that I was looking. I think we've got one person here who's actually two. Oh, two <laughs> sitting together uh, who are part of that steering group. So very grateful for that. But it's such a good point that you make because, uh, you know, we, we can't, or sometimes in terms of being experts and looking at data, we again lose that emotional connection to the reality and as well-meaning as we can be, we can also veer off in the wrong direction occasionally. So making sure that we're constantly challenged to come back to the main point is, is, um, is really important to us. Um, I can speak on behalf of our organisation. We've got 10% of our organisation um, that has got lived experience through homelessness. So, um, and uh, one of our incredible um, uh, Pete Brothers, that uh, he's actually our corporate educator, so he, um, you know, creates the opportunity for people to have a wider understanding in the corporate world, and has um, we have, you know, corporate days as such to understand how we operate, both as an organisation, but how to get the message out there. Um, and quick plug for my own organisation, Street Care, um, yeah. Consumer Advisory Committee, and hi Maddie, who's here, and Mary, who's a former member who's here somewhere as well. Um, one final question, um, I think we'll send to David, because it's, I, I do think that people are really interested in the, the zero concept. Um, so there has been a focus on rough sleeping and a questioner has noted that people tend to churn through crisis, short term, couch surfing, poor rooming houses as well as rough sleeping. That's absolutely correct in my experience. Um, so how does functional zero work for these people? Um, well, it helps identify what's going on. So at the moment we don't, we, we know that anecdotally, but when we go to policy makers and we say this is what it's costing us, you can go and get Deloitte to do your report or you can actually have the data that shows exactly what's going on. And you can go to the health system and say, this person has been in and out of your emergency department 12 times. Mm -hmm. And this person is, you know, so you can follow the data and show with evidence what's going on, that that churn's happening. And you can see what services are working and you can see what isn't, what isn't, isn't working. So that's, that's the real benefit you get from that approach. And I think um, what Roseanne Haggerty said to us when she was out is that, I was reflecting on my way over here that from Adelaide, is that, you know, a plane, when it flies, is going in the wrong direction 90% of the time. Uh, and the pilot uses the dashboard in front of them to get back on course and they're constantly recorrecting. And you still get to your destination, but they're constant because you get blown off course by wind. And so they're recorrecting constantly. And so what do we do in the homeless sector? We get a street count once, three times a year. We need to recorrect every day, not three times a year. And that's what the dashboard or the, the functional zero approach gives you. It gives you the evidence to do that every day. Fantastic. Um, I, I will stop the questions um, there, but I, I'll just close with one very quick reflection. Um, I was really intrigued um, to hear the Lord Mayor open speaking about the importance of compassion and about Melbourne wanting to be a generous city. Um, and I think that we are a national conference and one question that we can take away and all have a think about, although I assume we'll probably have largely the same answer, is what kind of country does Australia want to be? Um, and what kind of community do we, as a national forum, want to want to create? Um, on that note, can I please ask you to join me in thanking our panel, panel the Right Honourable Sally Clark, David Pearson, Monique Wiseman, Lucy Adams.